Okay, let's get into this because a lot of people want to know how to drastically increase their social security benefits. And there is one simple fix. And a lot of people don't like that idea that there is one simple fix, but there actually is one. Neither President Trump nor President Biden are putting this fix on the table. There's no candidate, none of them, not a single one that was running for president, not this 2025 presidential season, not in 2020, none of them. And here's why. The fix would actually give the power back to the people. And the federal government does not like to do that. You see, ever since we had the formulation of the Constitution, we've started to lose more and more rights. And as time goes on, they keep narrowing down what we're allowed to do with those rights. So, as you know, we usually don't get more rights. Now, a lot of people firmly believe incorrectly, that they have a right to Social Security benefits, that they should be given a boost, that they could sue the SSA to go ahead and get an increase for those benefits. There is no right. From the Cato Institute, is there a right to Social Security? This was written back in 1990, uh, 1998 by Michael D. Tanner. You worked hard your whole life and paid thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in social security taxes. Now it's time to retire. You're legally entitled to social security benefits, correct? Wrong. There's no legal right to social security. And that is uh, why many people believe that they have an earned right. That is, they think that because they have paid these social security taxes, that they are entitled to receive social security benefits. You're not. You don't have a right to your retirement benefits. You don't have a right to your SSDI benefits. Okay. These are not definitive rights. Okay. The government encourages that belief by referring to Social Security taxes as contributions, as in the Federal Insurance Contributions Act. However, in the 1960s case of Fleming v. Nestor, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that workers have no legally binding contractual rights to their social security benefits and that those benefits can be cut or even eliminated at any time. This is important to understand. You know, I would like to sue the federal government to increase benefits based off of how they change the cost of living adjustment math because the COLA, as we have it, is total BS. And people are getting $500 less per month. That's what the DC nonprofits found. 500 bucks per month, less than what they should be getting as a result of this cost of living adjustment math that's been done. Do you have a right to sue the government for changing the program or changing the math or changing how much they're going to give you? No, you don't. Ephraim Nestor was a Bulgarian immigrant who came into the United States in 1918 and paid Social Security taxes from 1936, the year the system began operating, until he retired in 1955, a year after he retired. Nestor was deported for having been a member of the Communist Party in the 1930s. In 1954, Congress had passed a law saying that any person deported from the United States should lose his Social Security benefits. Accordingly, Nestor's 55 60 per month $55.60, mind you. Remember, it was a different world back then. The U.S. dollar meant something. Per month, Social Security checks were stopped. Nestor sued, claiming that because he had paid for the Social Security benefits via his Social Security taxes, he had a right to Social Security benefits. The Supreme Court disagreed, saying to engraft upon the Social, social Security system a concept of accrued property rights would deprive it of the flexibility and the boldness in adjustment to ever-changing conditions which it demands. So the Supreme Court effed y'all over. It effed everybody over that pays into this system. Because when they do the math, however they want to do the math, we can't sue them. We have no right to the money. They could give us literally less, and we have no right to change that. All right, so bottom line is the court went on to say, it is apparent that the non-contractual interest of an employee covered by the Social Security Act cannot 
be soundly energized, sorry, it's I'm tired, to that of the holder of an annuity whose right to benefits is bottomed on his contractual premium payments. So just to kind of give you what that means, it means that we could fix this entire system. We could get you your real money. We could get you what you're supposed to get each month. We could increase social security, retirement, disability, widows, survivors, disability adult child, disabled adult child benefits. We could give you the largest amount you've ever seen in benefits if you had a right to them. Court's decision was not surprising. In an earlier case, Halvering v. Davis, 1937, the court had ruled that the Social Security was not a contributory insurance program, saying the proceeds of both the employee and employer taxes are to be paid into the Treasury like any other internal revenue generally and are not earmarked in any way. Putting it simply, if the federal government wanted to take that money, the Retirement Trust Fund, albeit there would be a massive, massive uprising. If they wanted to take that money and spend it on, who knows, trans rights in Afghanistan, they could do that. They have the right to do that. You don't. You don't have a say in it. In other words, Social Security is not an insurance program at all. It is a simple payroll tax on one side and a welfare program on the other. Your Social Security benefits are always subject to the whim of 535 politicians in Washington. Congress has cut Social Security benefits in the past and is going to do it in the future. Not just likely, they are going to do it in the future. In fact, given Social Security's financial crisis, benefit cuts are almost inevitable. Several proposals to cut benefits from increasing the retirement age means testing are already being debated. Okay. All right. In contrast... Under a privatized social security system, workers would have full property rights in their retirement accounts. They would own the money in them the same way people own their IRAs or 401k plans. Congress would have no right to touch the money. And if they did, we would sue them. Opponents of privatizing social security often warn that it would be risky to rely on private markets to provide retirement benefits. Now, see, here's the problem. Here's where the bullshit starts coming through. Okay. We don't have to privatize Social Security benefits and how we invest the money, although it would be smart to do some of that. Not full, but some of that. All we have to do is give a constitutional right to the recipients of Social Security benefits and future beneficiaries. That's all we got to do, because then people like me can sue the government and we can do a massive multi-million person class action against them. All right. Opponents of privatizing Social Security often warn that it would be risky, uh, you know, but with the Social Security system more than $10 trillion in debt being forced, and that was back in, back in 1998, being forced to rely on unsupported promises of politicians is far more risky. Indeed, only privatization would give Americans a true right to their Social Security. And that's not entirely accurate. How do we change it? How do we get you the most Social Security benefits you've ever had in your entire life? Well, we create a constitutional amendment that gives Americans a full right to their Social Security benefits, just like they were a stock or a bond or whatever that you pay for, that you have a legal right. If they don't give you what they're supposed to give you, you can sue them and get damages. Constitutional amendment process from the National Archives. The authority to amend the Constitution of the United States is derived from Article 5 of the Constitution. After Congress proposed, uh, proposes an amendment, the archivist of the United States, who heads the National Archives and records administration, uh, and records administration, rather, NARA, it's the National Archives and Records Administration, is charged with the responsibility for administering, administering the ratification process under the provisions of 1 U.S.C. 106B. So there's a magical archivist or archivist. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it because I never deal with any of that. There's an archivist or an archivist. Who knows? Who knows? I'll look it up later. And this person, when something is sought to be a constitutional amendment, he begins the process of pulling out the Harry Potter wand to put it into the books as to what's going on. 
They are charged with the responsibility for administering the ratification process under the provisions of 1 U.S.C. 106B. The archivist has delegated many of the ministerial duties associated with this function to the director of the Federal Register. Neither Article 5 of the Constitution nor Section 106B describe the ratification process in detail, which is kind of how a lot of that super high-level stuff goes. You ever notice that when it comes to, like, Supreme Court rules or rules for the president? Nobody really knows in detail, right? Because it just wasn't detail-oriented when they wrote it. The archivist, I'm just calling it different things at this point to see which one I want to stick with, and the director of the Federal Register followed procedures and customs established by the Secretary of the State, who's performed these duties until 1950. The administration, the administrator of general services, who served in this capacity until NARA assumed responsibility as an independent agency in 1985. A bunch of fluff crap, not important. Let's keep reading so we get to how we actually do it, right? The Constitution provides that an amendment may be proposed either by Congress with a two-thirds majority. So, so just to clarify, that sucks. A two-thirds majority sucks for making this happen because there's no way you're going to get two-thirds of these politicians that we have, that we keep voting in, that have been there for over two decades, many of them, to actually support this. Eh, it's just, you know, it's a problem. Now, two-thirds vote is usually very good because it keeps the riffraff bills from coming to light. Congress, with a two-thirds majority vote in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, or by a constitutional convention called for by two-thirds of the state legislators, none of the 27 amendments to the Constitution have been proposed by constitutional convention. Although there is a big one going on right now that may actually change things. It, it, it may, there's one going on right now that actually might have one go through. The Congress proposed an amendment in the form of a joint resolution. Since the president does not have a constitutional role in the amendment process, the joint resolution does not go to the White House for signature or approval. So whoever's president, Biden or Trump, screw them. They don't get to decide. They don't get to be part of it. They can just chill out. The original document is forwarded directly to NARA's Office of the Federal Register for Processing and Publication. The OFR adds legislative history notes to the joint resolution and publishes it in slip law format which everybody knows is one of the ugliest ways to have to read things, slip law format. The OFR also assembles an information package for the states, which include formal red line copies of the joint resolution, copies of the joint resolution in slip law format, and the statutory procedures for ratification under 1 U.S.C. 106B. So in other words, this is what we need to do. I know that you guys are like, well, you know, this seems tough. Well, this seems like a lot. Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to seem a lot more important when they take away 25% of your retirement benefits in nine years. Then you might have been like, you know, shit, I should have cared. I should have maybe done something like this. I should have maybe participated in something like this. The archivist submits the proposed amendments to the states for their consideration by sending a letter of notification to each governor along with the informational material prepared by the OFR. The governors then formally submit the amendments to their state legislators or the state calls for a convention, depending on what Congress has specified. In the past, some state legislators have not waited to receive official notice before taking action on a proposed amendment. When a state ratifies a proposed amendment, it sends the archivist an original or certified copy of the state action, which is immediately conveyed to the director of the Federal Register. It's a lot of pomp and circumstance with this, but that's a good thing. I mean, it's a big, big deal. The OFR examines ratification documents for facial legal sufficiency and an authenticating signature. <sighs> the signature, right? The John Hancock. If the documents are found to be in good order, the director acknowledges receipt and maintains custody of them. The OFR retains these documents until an amendment is adopted or fails and then transfers the records to the National Archives for preservation. A proposed amendment becomes part of the Constitution as soon as it is ratified by three-fourths of the states. So you need 38 out of the 50 states to get on board. I know that we could leverage this. I know that we could get enough pissed off retired and disabled people to force and leverage politicians to do this. I know we could do it. When the OFR verifies that it has received the required number of authenticated ratification documents, it drafts a formal proclamation to the archivist to certify that the amendment is valid and has become part of the Constitution. This certification is published in the Federal Register and the U.S. statutes at large and serves as official notice to the Congress and to the nation that the amendment process has been completed. 
in a few instances. States have sent official documents to NARA to record the rejection of an amendment or the rescission of a prior ratification. The archivist does not make any substantive determinations as to the validity of state ratification actions, but it has been established that the archivist's certification of the facial legal sufficiency of ratification documents is final and conclusive. So, I mean, that's scary. There's one, I mean, to, they could just, that one person could just be like, <laughs> it's not, this is not the signature. This is not the John Hancock we want. In recent history, the signing of the certification has become a ceremonial function attended by various dignitaries, which may include the president. President Johnson signed the certifications for the 24th and 25th Amendments as a witness, and President Nixon similarly witnessed the certification of the 26th Amendment along with three young scholars. On May 18, 1992, the archivist performed the duties of the certifying official for the first time to recognize the ratification of the 27th Amendment, and the director of the Federal Register signed the certification as a witness. Okay, so what do we do? It's very simple. Neither Trump nor Biden give a shit about doing this. They don't care. They're not going to be caring to do this. Because if they do this, then all of a sudden, what will happen is the United States government can get sued for not giving us what we paid for. We would, at that point, have the ability to sue them for improper handling of the cost of living adjustment math that they use, thereby giving us obnoxiously low increases per year when the dollar has actually significantly declined to the point where it is absolutely hilariously horrific that we would get out 3% when it's gone up 20%. Okay? We would be able to go ahead and ask tough questions and get real answers. We would be able to sue them. We would be able to take it to the Supreme Court because obviously this is a constitutional issue. It's just not at the moment. So how do we get a lot more social security benefits? How do we get them to start caring? How do we get them to start investing and paying the US citizens what they're supposed to have? Because remember, I just wanna point out one basic thing, okay? The greatest country in the world shouldn't be in a situation where they're trying to raise the retirement age. It should be going the other way. The greatest country in the world, if properly led, if properly functioning, should actually be reducing it. Full retirement age shouldn't be 67. It should be going back down to 65, then down to 63. So the point that I'm getting at here is that the only way for us to do what we actually need to do, the only way, okay, the only way to do this is to go ahead and get an actual constitutional amendment where all people who are American citizens have a future right and a current right to social security benefits and that all this math game crap that they use to give you less, we can sue them. And the extension of that, the beautiful thing with that, is that ultimately the programs that interact with Social Security benefits then can be part of the suit. So when they play the game where you increase here and they decrease here, you'll be able to sue them. Because you'll be able to enjoy all these other programs and say, hey, constitutional right, I should have constitutional right to these, yada, yada, yada. So the point is, we have to move in this direction. This is the best fix. This is the easiest fix if you look at it from going into the future and being starved out of food, and being starved out of having a living under a roof around the walls that you paid for when you were younger. It is my firm belief that we just need one politician to have the cojones to actually do something like this and begin it. I can't be that politician. Although, to be fair, it's a usual, I mean, this is the lineup you usually get, right? You usually get somebody who's a lawyer, who owns a law firm, who then at some point, right, could potentially sell the firm and then be like, what am I going to do now? And then you do the political thing, and this is the main thing. This is the main fix. I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you, if we look at 
the rest of uh, you know we're in we're in twenty you know four right now. If we look at the rest of the hundred year cycle, right, two thousand to twenty one hundred. If we look at that, okay. If we get this passed, it would be the most important constitutional addition in the history of Americans from 2000 to 2100. I guarantee it. Because think about it. We have Social Security benefits because the government was doing this to punish the general population to help those who couldn't save. It's progressive. People who pay in a lot less got a hell of a lot more. People who pay in a hell of a lot get very little. It was done to punish the general population because the federal government was afraid of riots from the general population who had nothing to lose. Because when they got old, they didn't have stuff. And when you get somebody who's old who doesn't have stuff, they're not afraid to go to jail. It is the exact same reason that we have SSI benefits. Look at the timeline, 1930s, retirement, 1950s, disability, 1970s, SSI. They're afraid of us. And they know that they can appease us if they give us a monthly check. But then they nibble away at that monthly check until it becomes not worth something that we can actually use to be tamed. So my point is the way to get the most social security benefits is to allow attorneys to sue the federal government by giving the American people a constitutional right to their benefits. Interesting, right? Because remember, they literally have the power to take all of the money in the trust funds, the Medicare, the retirement, the disability, and spend it, okay, on some bad program that deserves it far less than you in another country. How many of you guys have ever sat there and wondered, you know, like, and that's, that's the funny part about this. You know, like how people talk about like, oh, if you just invest into this thing when you're this young, 30 years later, it's huge. Well, you ever sat, sit back and think if we didn't spend so much money on these foreign nations that are all set up by themselves? Like, you ever sit back and think, like, why, why are we giving so much money to all these European nations, to all of these Middle East nations? Why are we, we, we they, they can't stand on their own two feet? Why? Is it just to get them to use our reserve currency? What's the deal? The point is, if you took all that money and you invested it properly, there would be no Social Security deficit. None at all. None at all. I will catch you guys a little bit later. I do have to go ahead and uh, go to bed. Uh, I'm going to be waking up early. But there was a hit piece on Martin O'Malley. We're going to be covering that tomorrow. It's absolutely disgusting. And, you know, the funny thing is the more and more I learn and grow with Social Security benefits, the more and more the spin and the bull, it's just like, you know, I, I'm amazed. I, I'm truly amazed. And the legacy news, the legacy news, they push this crap. And it's disgusting. All right. I will catch you guys a little bit later. You have an absolutely wonderful night. Please remember to like and subscribe. Go to Google, type in Disability Resolution PA or Disability Resolution Flo uh, Florida or Disability Resolution Law Firm. Throw some stars up on the board on Google. I will catch you a little bit later. Please remember, we do Tuesdays and Thursdays where I go live. I answer questions. Five to seven minutes is usually the length. You have to call in with a fake name. Remember to have your legal question up front. No story mode. Uh, with that said, if you need more than that, go to the bio. You can always hire me for a private hour. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You send the money, you sign the mini contract, and there you go. We put you on the uh, hearing calendar. I will catch you all a little bit later. Have a wonderful night, and thank you so much. All right, bye-bye, everybody. Have fun. Bye-bye.